everyone's availability and schedules. So it will basically be what we've been doing here with the Abraxas Lodge, um, but to suit people from all around the world on a variety of different subjects. So um, if you follow my Facebook, I will keep you updated regarding uh, any announcements. Uh, this is hopefully something we want to get off the ground within the next month or two. So uh, with that announcement out of the way, let's have a look at our topic. So we'll be looking at the Druids and I'll just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so and over the past three weeks, we've examined different cultures. We started with the wisdom of the Upanishads in week one. We then went on to look at the Egyptian mysteries and last week, the mystery schools of ancient Greece. We saw that there were some fundamental similarities in all three of those different philosophies and schools of thought that they are really founded on those same perennial principles, which we know as theosophy or the ancient wisdom. One culture which is generally from, from the perspective of the theosophical movement that has been less examined or less spoken about um, or written about is that of the Celtic world and the Druid. However, I think we'll find in examining the Celtic world, uh, we'll, we'll find as much variety of, of wisdom and and knowledge and we'll find the same fundamental themes as we find in Greece and in Egypt and in India. Uh, and so I think we can conclusively say that the Druidic worldview or the Celtic worldview is also one branch of the ageless wisdom tradition. And the Druidic path and the Druidic culture is something which in my personal life it has always been uh, profoundly interesting and meaningful to me. Aside from my theosophical work, I'm also a member of a number of Druidic orders. I'm involved in uh, the Druidic, modern Druidic work, which may differ in some regard to that of the ancient Druids. But today we'll try and look at some of the ancient wisdom of the Druids and discover how that relates to modern philosophy. So as always, we have a few objectives for today's class. We'll look at the background and context of the teachings of the Druids, uh, the Druids being the Celtic priesthood, essentially, in the context of Celtic religion and mythology. We'll also take a comparative glance at the similarities between the teachings of the Druids and their esoteric significances and those of other ancient cultures and modern theosophy. We'll try to identify some key themes in the cosmology and teachings of the Druids. And we'll try and decipher some of the esoteric meanings in their mythology. And finally, we'll have a look at the purpose and relevance of the Druidic teachings and rites and how we can understand these better in the light of philosophy. So we'll begin by having a look at a, a prayer, which is called the Gorsid prayer. Now this is not particularly ancient, um, but it's still very Druidic in its, in its intention, in, in the meaning behind it. We'll see that in an examination of the history of the Druids, they essentially went out of existence with the Roman conquest of Britain. Uh, so essentially 2000 years ago. However, there was a revival in the interest of <laughs> Druidry and not just Druidry, an interest in the uh, pagan, you know, the pre-Christian pagan religions uh, of, of the British Isles, of Greece of Rome. This occurred around the 1700s. And so it was around this time that the Druid revivalists. Uh, um, that the Druid I just wanted to ask everyone. Oh, sorry, Nancy, you have muted yourself now, it would seem. Okay, um, everyone, please mute yourselves and go ahead, Luke. I'm sorry. All right, no problem. Uh, so yes, around the the 1700s, we saw this 
Druidic revival, or this pagan revival, to speak more broadly. And it was around this time that this Druid prayer was, was composed uh, originally in Welsh. You'll see the Welsh on the left-hand side. And I don't speak Welsh, uh, so I won't attempt to read the Welsh. However, we will have a look at the English translation, the Gorsid Prayer, which states, Grant us, O God, thy protection, and in protection, strength, and in strength, understanding, and in understanding, knowledge, and in knowledge, the knowledge of justice, and in knowledge of justice, the love of it, and in that love, the love of existence, and in that love of existence, the love of God, <laughs> God and all goodness. Well, I think this is a very, a very simple prayer, but we see in here some of the central ideas at the heart of the, the Druidic worldview. These ideas of protection, strength, understanding, knowledge, justice, and the love of existence. And there, through the love of existence, they find the good, the goodness at the heart of the universe. And so I think this really sum, summarizes the Druidic worldview and gives you a bit of a, a summary or a, an overview of some of the themes that we'll find within this worldview. We'll also look at a couple of quotes from theosophical writers on the Druids. As I mentioned, there hasn't been so much theosophical literature uh, regarding the Druids, but there has been some, and some of it is to be found in such foundational works as Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine. This pamphlet that we're quoting from here was written by Peter Freeman. Now, Peter Freeman was one of the, one of the founding members of the Theosophical Society in Wales. He had a big impact on the, the Welsh section, on its establishment and getting things running. Um, and he wrote a short pamphlet titled The Druids and Theosophy, which was uh, contained a foreword by Dr. Annie Besant, then international president of the society. And in, the, in this pamphlet, he states, it does not seem unreasonable to assume that the Druids were to the fourth subrace, what the theosophical movement is to the fifth. And that the same great fundamental teachings of life which inspired the Druids are now the ideals by which many try to live as theosophists. But I think in this short quote, Peter Freeman captures the idea that I am going to be putting forward in this presentation, essentially that Druidism was ancient theosophy. It was in the context and the location of the British Isles this was the Theosophical movement of that period. Also a couple of other useful quotes here. If we turn to Meta Blavatsky herself, she states in Isis Unveiled, the Druids of Great Britain practiced it in the silent crypts of their deep caves. And Pliny devotes many a chapter to the leader of the leaders of the Celts. The Semophies, the Druids of the Gauls, expounded the physical as well as the spiritual sciences. They taught the secrets of the universe, the harmonious progress of the heavenly bodies, the formation of the earth, and above all, the immortality of the soul. I think there's a few interesting things to pick apart from this quote. First of all, I think it's very interesting that the Druids are referred to as the leaders of the Celts. And from understanding that they were considered to be the leaders of the Celts, we, we see something about the prioritization of the Celtic worldview. The Celts did have kings and queens. They did have uh, rulers and leaders. However, the, even the kings and queens in the Celtic world would look up to the Druids as the fundamental leaders of their culture. And so we see there a similarity to the, the ancient Indian worldview as well, where we have the Brahmin caste, for example. That's the other, that even the kings and the warriors would look up to and respect. So I think we can draw a, a clear analogy there that in these, in a variety of these ancient cultures, we do have the kings as the sort of, um, the, the leaders in terms of the society and the way things are run, 
but and perhaps in times of war and so on. But then we also have the spiritual leaders, and we see that the spiritual have a different role, and, and the but it's a role in which the <laughs> takes primacy perhaps in the culture. And so even the kings would look up to these great teachers for inspiration and for wisdom and for advice in their secular rule of their kingdoms as well. And so we see that the, the Druids took on a variety of roles. They were knowledgeable in the physical sciences of the day, yet they were also knowledgeable in the spiritual sciences. In fact, it's hard to, it's hard to use an English word to capture the role of the Druids. We can't simply say that the Druids were the priests of the Celtic people, although that was one aspect oh. of their role. Neither can we say that they were simply the leaders of the Celtic people, although that was one aspect of their role. Beyond that, we could also say that they were the custodians of the cultural wisdom of the Celtic people, and yet they did not commit this cultural wisdom to writing, as we will see very shortly. It was handed down through an oral tradition. There were also the judges, the, the lawmakers of the land, who would determine the, what was in, in accordance with the unwritten but understood laws of the running of their society. They were also the chief advisors of kings and rulers. They were also diviners in that they would, they would read the signs in nature, the hidden signs or the occult significance of nature in order to better predict the outcome of certain decisions or certain uh, movements of the society. And so we see that they have this, this vast variety of roles, each one being significant uh, beyond that, we could also say they were doctors in the physical sense. They were the, the, the physicians of the day. And so they had many significant roles to play. And one of the themes we will be looking at towards the end of this class is Stonehenge, because I, I know from some of our other classes that a few people expressed interest in Stonehenge, and we'll see how that connects to the Druids. And one theosophist who did write on this topic was A.P. Sinet, uh, well known for having received some letters from the Mahatmas. But in the Pyramids and Stonehenge, Mr. Sinet states that the worship of the early Druids, to give that name to the occult teachers who made Stonehenge their headquarters, was grandiose and simple. There were processions and chants and symbolical ceremonies associated with astronomical events especially with the rising of the sun on Midsummer Day. In accordance with the elaborate symbolism of a great of multifarious significance, and as the adept druids could easily control these creatures. So a few interesting things mentioned in, in A.B. Sinnott's work here. Firstly, he states that the Druids made Stonehenge their headquarters, and maybe there you'll get a bit of a, a clue as to what we'll be talking about later. The fact that Stonehenge was not, despite the popular misconception, constructed by the Druids or by the Celts, it was rather adopted by them or used by them after a previous culture had finished using it. We also see the deep significance of the sun to the, the Druids and to the Celtic people. Uh, many of their rites and rituals and ceremonies were centered around the significance of the sun uh, in accordance with their understanding of the role of the sun and the solar logos in the nature of manifestation. We also see a deep significance uh, in the serpent and the Druids were known to be serpent tamers and uh, we, we can perhaps draw some conclusions there uh, in, in accordance with the idea of the Ouroboros or the serpent, the eternal serpent that eats its own tail but is perpetually and cyclically reborn. And we'll see that in the symbol or the seal of the Theosophical Society. Okay, let's continue on. In Eyes is Unveiled, Madame Blavatsky gives us a little bit more information about the Druids and their 
their equivalents to some of the great uh, cultures or the other uh, priesthoods of other great cultures. She states, the mystery veiling the origin and the religion of the Druids is as great as that of their supposed fanes, temples, is to the modern symbologist, but not to the initiated occultists. Their priests were the descendants of the last Atlanteans, and what is known of them is sufficient to allow the inference that they were Eastern priests akin to the Chaldeans and the Indians, though little more. It may be inferred that they symbolize their deity as the Hindus do their Vishnu, as the Egyptians did their mystery god, as the builders of the Ohio Great Serpent Mound worshipped theirs, namely under the form of the mighty serpent, the emblem of the eternal deity time, the Hindu Kala. Pliny called them the Magi of the Gauls and Britons, but they were more than that. The author of the Indian Antiquities, Thomas Morris, finds such affinity between the Druids and the Brahmins of India. Dr. Borles points to a close analogy between them and the Magi of Pope Persia. Others will see an identity between them and the Orphic priesthood of Thrace that we discussed in our last week's class, simply because they were connected in their esoteric teachings of the universal wisdom religion and thus presented affinities with the exoteric worship of all. There's a couple of interesting things there. Again, the association between the Druids and the serpent. And here, Madame Blavatsky calls the serpent the emblem of the eternal deity time. And if, I think if we take this, this symbol, the Ouroboros, uh, we can see it vaguely in the, the background of this slide here or in the seal of the Theosophical Society. We can see how this symbolizes time, the idea of time, the serpent that continually eats itself and is reborn. It's a symbolic presentation of, of the periods of Mambantara and Pulaya, the eternal cycle of manifestation and unmanifestation. So now to have a look a bit at, at who exactly the Druids were and what their role was in the context of the Celtic world. Essentially, the Druids were the custodians of the ancient wisdom of the Celtic people. They possessed knowledge of the various sciences, the art of music and poetry, of right governance and justice, and were also responsible for the preservation of the genealogical record of their tribe. Once the wisest of the West, they were driven out by persecution and ignorance, robbed of their ancestral lands and eventually extinguished altogether. Their wisdom, however, lives on for the unbroken record of the ancient wisdom that we have inherited in our modern age for the teachings of theosophy. So again, as we mentioned in previous uh, classes, Although we see the, the rise and the fall of these great, these great schools of thought, and it can sometimes seem slightly morbid or depressing to see how the, to, to see the seeming candle of wisdom snuffed out, we, we know that in our examination, from our examination of theosophy, that it never really was extinguished. The flame continued. It was passed on secretly or passed on through the ages, through different organizations and schools. Again, theosophy cannot be contained permanently to, in any one organization or under any one system of thought. It must necessarily pass from one to another to another, depending on the needs and conditions of the time. So it, it's a periodical passing on from one organization to another or from one culture or one system of thought to another. So we know from the, the, the teachings in the secret doctrine that the Celts were of the fourth sub race of the Aryan root race. And as we mentioned in previous classes, the term race has a different connotation in theosophy than some of the negative connotations it has since developed after the writing of, of the secret doctrine. So race is more a period of time in the theosophical conception. It's a period of development. 
It's not to do with different races or anything to do with supremacy or one race being better than another. It's simply the passing of, of the, the evolutionary development. It's, it's a, cycle, a cycle of evolutionary development, if we like, would be one way to understand that. And so historically, the Celts are believed to have migrated from Central Asia to spread over the breadth of Europe. Despite repeated invasions and brutal persecution from the Roman Empire, the Celts lived on, or they continue to live on today, through the ethnic people of Brittany, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, and the Isle of Man. And you can see in the background a map of some of the areas where the Celtic people today still reside. Madame Blavatsky refers to the Druids at many points throughout the Secret Doctrine, speaking highly of their teachings and influence and comparing them with the Brahmins of India, the Magi of Persia, and the Orphic teachers of Greece. She further refers to them as the descendants of the last Atlanteans, and states that they were connected in the esoteric teachings with the universal wisdom religion. So we can see again that, that there is a, an inherent connection between the, according to theosophy, between the Atlantean race and that of the Druids. We see the Atlantean adepts spreading throughout different parts of the world to India, to Egypt, to Greece, and to the British Isles, where the Druidic religion was founded. Something rather unique and interesting about the Druidic culture was that the Druids did not commit their teachings to writing. Uh, the Celtic tradition was an oral tradition in which their entire history, their genealogy, their cosmology, their religion, and their myths were all transmitted through poetry and verse. And so they were, the Celtic people, in, in particular, particular the Druids and the Bards, which is one order of the, the Druidic priesthood, they were known for their memory, to have excellent skills of memory. They were able to recite from heart the entire mythology of their culture. They were able to trace the genealogy of their great kings down many, many generations from heart. Again, this was not committed to writing. They were able to recount the great stories of their, their histories and their, the, their wars and their victories and so on. All of this they were able to recount entirely through the medium of the mind. So it's quite an interesting, it's, it's quite an interesting account of the power of the mind when we look at this from a historical uh, perspective, we're able to see that nowadays we may struggle to remember a, a phone number or a person's name. But let's look at these these Celtic people of two to three thousand years ago, who were able to memorize the entire body of cultural knowledge and pass that on generation by generation. However, we do know something about the, the Druids and the Celts, and that is largely thanks to a number of prominent Greek and Roman writers, including Julius Caesar, who wrote largely on the Celts and the Druids. And from these, we can deduce a bit about their philosophy and their worldview and their practices. And so, from the classical writers, we learn that the Druids had a belief in reincarnation and that this belief was integral to their understanding of the world. So much like the, the Egyptians, the Greeks and the Indians, we, found, we find this central idea of reincarnation and that if we were to take this away, much of their mythology becomes nonsensical or much of their worldview becomes nonsensical. So in order to understand their worldview, we need to do so in the context of reincarnation. To the Celts, death was merely one aspect of the cycle of life. It was not an end, but rather a period of rest, a temporary darkness before the return of the dawn. So we see again that just like the Egyptians and the Greeks, that death was not a negative thing to the Celts. They weren't afraid of death or of discussing death. And so death was simply one aspect of 
life, and life was the greater whole that existed beyond death. And much like the Egyptians, uh, something that I, I didn't mention here in this slide, but interesting fact, that the Celts also began their day with night. Night was the beginning of the day. So we tend to begin our days with the morning, whereas the Celts began their day with the evening. So this was an interesting perspective of the, the nature of light and darkness or of life and death in the Celtic worldview. They understood just as we came from the primordial darkness that preceded life, so too does the day proceed from the night. So it's an interesting perspective which may seem rather foreign to our, our modern understanding of day and night and, and the idea that everything begins in light or everything begins in the morning or in the spring. Likewise, the Celtic New Year began in the autumn with Samhain, the uh, nowadays known as Halloween, but uh, which was originally a Celtic festival of the harvest. This was also the beginning of the Celtic year, beginning with the uh, preceding winter, so beginning in the evening of the year, if you like. So this perspective of life and death as alternating states of a broader continuous existence fits into their understanding of the world as being of a cyclic nature. To the Druids, everything was a cycle, from the seasons to the stages of life to the extremes of birth and death. The mythology reflected this cyclic thing with the seasons taking anthropomorphized forms throughout the wheel of the year, as heroes would die or journey to the other world and subsequently be reborn or return from the other world. Such cyclic initiation myths can be found in the mythologies of all cultures of the world. However, the Celts were particularly, particularly emphatic in their belief in the rebirth and immutability of the soul when contrasted with the prevailing Roman ideas of the time. So last, last week, we had a look at the Orphic myths, didn't we? And we, we looked in particular at the, the story of Persephone and Hades and Persephone's, Persephone's descent into the underworld and subsequent return. And we mentioned that this is very much in line with the, the dying and we, the, the gods that die and are reborn, as we find throughout all cultures and in all religions. And another example of that is, of course, the death and resurrection of Christ. There is no fundamental difference between these stories. It's the same idea. And so we find this also in the Celtic worldview. There are many stories of, many, many myths uh, of a dying god or a god who, or a hero in some cases, who descends into the other world and subsequently is reborn or returns. And we find that later clearly expressed in the Arthurian legend, in the Arthurian stories, which uh, while, uh, which, which though came about at the end towards the twilight of the Celtic world, um, were fundamentally rooted in Celtic ideas and may have derived from earlier Celtic myths. And so we will again today have a look at a a particular story. Uh, this is the story of Taliesin, and it's one of my personal favorites. I think there's a lot that can be understood about the Celtic worldview from an examination of this story. And so in this story, we have a number of characters. We have first Gwion Batch, who was a young boy, and we have a sorceress, Keridwen. Now, Keridwen, while in later accounts is considered a sorceress, we might better understand her as a goddess who was then in the Christianized myths, uh, sorry, the Christianized stories, was then turned into a sorceress, which was often the case. So some of the, because in the original transmission of these stories, they were not committed to writing. Once again, they were passed down in an old tradition. By the time that they were put into writing, it was not by the it was not by the druids themselves. It was by the Christian monks, and certain of these Christian monks were somewhat less friendly towards their interpretation of the uh, Celtic myths and legends. 
in particular, they would like to turn their gods and goddesses into less deific forms. So the goddesses often become sorceresses and the gods often become heroes or in, in some cases, demons or, or mythological fi uh, figures of a darker nature. So here we have a goddess, or in the later stories, a sorceress, Keridwen. And the legend goes that Keridwen had given birth to a son, and unfortunately for him, the son was incredibly ugly. And this was a problem for Keridwen. Uh, it might, it, uh, in this day and age, I would suppose that this would have been more of a hindrance than it may be in the modern world. And so she wanted to compensate for his ugliness by brewing him an elixir of prophetic wisdom. Now, this wasn't just some generic wisdom. This was the wisdom of everything, the wisdom of the nature of everything in existence. And so she, the, the process for brewing this prophetic elixir was very strict and difficult. It had to be stirred for a period of a year and a day. And this period of a year and a day is very significant in the Celtic year. This is the Celtic wheel of the year. Um, and so we see a, uh, there's, there's a lot of symbolism to be dissected from this. Um, but we will briefly mention the wheel of the year and how this relates to the seasons and so on and the festivals of the Celtic world uh, in a future slide. And so the important thing was that this potion had to be stirred continuously day and night. And so essentially we have this boy, Gwion Batch, who was hired by Keridwen to stir the potion with the help of an elderly man. And we can see this picture in the background here. We have Keridwen, the sorceress, we have the elderly man, and we have Gwion Batch who is uh, stirring the potion. So this wisdom was intended for her son. And, oh, I'm sorry, we missed a, there seems to be a missing page there, but no problem, I will recount the story. So I, at the end of the year and the day, the potion was just about ready to be given to her son. However, uh, on the very last day, a three drops from the potion spilt from the cauldron and landed on Guion's thumb. Now, the potion being incredibly hot, Guion did what anyone would naturally do, and he stuck his thumb into his mouth, thus consuming the first three drops of the potion. In doing this, the entire wisdom and knowledge and power, prophetic power of the elixir, was transferred to Gwion instead of to the son of Keridwen. And so having this prophetic knowledge, the first thing that Gwion realized was that Keridwen would probably be quite angry. And so he fled, and using the powers of the potion, he shapeshifted into various animal forms. And so this was the first gift that he discovered through the power of this, this elixir, the power to shift forms. However, Keridwen, being a goddess, also possessed special powers and was able to shift her forms. And so we have Gwion shifting into a hare, and we have uh, Keridwen shifting into various animals, such as a fox and so on. And, she, and this chase ensues until eventually we are transformed into a grain of wheat. Keridwen, however, takes the form of a hen and consumes Gwion. And in so doing, she becomes pregnant with Gwion, with, with Gwion, uh, with the spirit of Gwion, if you like. And nine months later, she gives birth to the boy in human form. This being Taliesin, the inspired poet seer of Celtic legend. Now, this is a very interesting myth, and you'll find it in a variety of forms, but the essential idea is what I have just uh, shared with you. And Taliesin, interestingly, was a historical figure. He was a real uh, poet and bard of, um, of the British Isles, and a well-known one at that. And this is sort of a, a legendary story that was built up around the figure of Taliesin. But there's a lot of significance that we can find within this. 
And so essentially this myth encapsulates the heart of the Druidic worldview. In it, we find the themes of cyclic death and rebirth, of spiritual initiation, of the transformation of worldly forms and of alchemical transmutation. So when we consider the, the, wheel of the, the wheel of the year, the fact that it takes a year and a day, it takes the entire process of a Manvantara for this, for this wisdom to be granted to the aspirant, to Guion. We also see Guion's spiritual initiation through the consumption of the, consumption of the elixir. We find his symbolic death and rebirth in being consumed as the, the grain of wheat and then again reborn in the child Taliesin. We also find the theme of alchemical transmutation in the taking of what was essentially a base potion and turning it into a potion of immortality and a potion of wisdom. And this divine inspiration or this prophetic wisdom which the boy Guion received from the potion was called by the Welsh Arwen. And it was conceived as being the flowing spirit and essence of life. It was Arwen that was the fount of all knowledge and inspiration. And it was thus the muse of bards and poets. This conception of a flowing spirit as the essence of life further reveals an understanding of a universe pervaded by cyclic motion in which birth and death, creation and destruction and the incessant changing of the seasons are but the eternal turnings of the wheel. And we can see in this slide a presentation of the wheel of the year. We can't quite see all of it, but you may get the, the idea that we have the, the fall or the, the autumn equinox. We have All Hallows Day as, it's, as it was known in the Catholic tradition, but was previously known as Samhain, and so on and on around the year we have these festivals which are connected fundamentally with events taking place in the, the fields. Uh, it's a seasonal, a seasonal uh, cycle and it's very connected to the planting and the harvesting of crops. So we find that the cults as a people were very much in tune with the natural world. And because of their, their state of being in, in attunement with the natural world, they understood the nature of reality as being cyclic. They saw this cyclic aspect of existence and they based their philosophy around that. And so Celtic myth is rooted in the processes of nature. It is a symbolic rendering in story of that which was perceived by, its, by an observation of the natural environment. Madame Blavatsky writes of Druid, Druidic veneration for nature in Isis Unveiled, in which she praisingly notes that they would gather in their natural academies, built by the hand of the invisible architect, where the chaste goddess of night beamed her most silvery rays on their oak-crowned heads, and their white-robed sacred bards knew how to converse with the solitary queen of the starry vault. To the Druids, nature itself was a temple, finally ordained by the gods, and the sun an ever-burning flame that would illuminate both hearts and minds. So we will now digress slightly to have a look at to have a look at the topic of Stonehenge. And so Stonehenge is not in essence related to the Druids, but it is in that the Druids adopted Stonehenge and ended up using it. So the following is all from the perspective of theosophy. And as always, you are welcome to welcome to take these theosophical ideas and adopt them, or you're welcome to discard them, or you're welcome to investigate and make up your own mind. There are no dogmas in theosophy. Everyone is welcome to investigate themselves and reach their own conclusions. But in this section, I'll be simply presenting what some theosophical teachers and writers have stated regarding Stonehenge based on their own discoveries and research.
And so according to A.P. Sinnott, in his work on the pyramids and Stonehenge, following the Atlantean migration to Egypt, the adepts of Atlantis established themselves in the British Isles. And it was under their influence that a great civilization emerged and that Stonehenge was constructed as a temple whereby the rites of the ancient wisdom could be carried out. And A.P. Sinnott also mentions that the simplicity of the temple in comparison perhaps to some of the, the Atlantean structures was deliberate. It was an intentional protest against the corrupt luxury of lost Atlantis. So for those here who have studied the theosophical teachings regarding Atlantis, you still know that the, the fall of Atlantis was preceded by a period of extreme materialism in which the in, in which luxury was considered the highest attainment over spiritual wisdom and knowledge. And that this, this adoration of the physical and this adoration or lust for money and for, for treasure and for luxury was largely what caused the downfall, first of all, the spiritual and later the physical downfall of, the, of Atlantis. And so we see that the adepts having departed Atlantis and spreading across the other continents of the world brought theosophy or the ancient wisdom to the British Isles and established Stonehenge or assisted in the establishment of Stonehenge. So we can see from that according to AP Sinnott, Stonehenge was established by the Atlantean adepts. However, these, these adepts of Atlantis, they possessed knowledge of the forces whereby gravity may be manipulated. So one of the great mysteries is how were these gigantic stones, which we know came from Ireland, how were these gigantic stones brought right across the sea with the limited technology that would have been available to the inhabitants of the British Isles of that time? And this is the same question as to the construction of the pyramids, of course. And so according to A.P. Sinnott, this may have taken place through the means of levitation and that it was through the utilization of this force that the gigantic stones were transported over the sea to their location in England. Also, according to A.P. Sinnott, clairvoyant observers of Stonehenge have tapped into the memory of nature and beheld aspects of the process of this construction. And so this idea of the memory of nature is it's a very interesting concept in the theosophical worldview, but I think it would be worth going into that in a little bit more depth. The memory of nature are sometimes called the Akasic records. That's the Sanskrit term for sky, space, or aether. And they're sometimes described as the memory of nature. The subtle matter that composes the different planes of the cosmos has the ability to receive and record impressions of everything that happens on the terrestrial plane. So in order to understand this, we need to understand, first of all, that the, in the theosophical worldview, there is more than simply the physical plane. In fact, there are a variety or seven planes of existence. And certain of these planes have the ability to record impressions. Okay, so on the more astral level, it is possible to discover records of history that may not be perceivable on the physical plane. And so these records, which can be seen by some clairvoyants, exist on several planes. The records on the astral plane, known as the astral light, are said to be fragmentary and unreliable. However, the ones preserved on the mental plane, though more difficult to access, are said to be accurate. The latter are the true Akasic records. So this also explains sometimes the disagreement among clairvoyants. We will sometimes say, see certain clairvoyants making um, claims of the age of certain things or certain claims about Atlantis and so on, which may disagree with those of different clairvoyants. And this is easily explained by the fact that certain clairvoyants may be reading the records on the astral plane, whereas others may be reading them on the mental plane. But we know that the mental plane records are more accurate being from a higher level, coming from a higher level, from a higher and more spiritual plane, 
than those of the astral plane, which are only very slightly removed from those of the physical plane, and therefore more uh, prone to corruption. And so a quote from the Pyramids and Stonehenge. Working under the guidance and with the help of the adepts from Atlantis, the builders of Stonehenge and of the ancient dolmen altars found the enormous masses of stone and they used light enough to be handled with facility. So although there were physical builders um, working on the construction of Stonehenge, they did so with the help of the, the adepts the Atlantean adepts. And this applies not only to Stonehenge, but to all of the great stone circles and dolmens, as they are often called, uh, throughout the British Isles and in other parts of Europe where the Celtic uh, people spread. We also have a quote from Bishop Charles Webster Leadbeater in his work, The David Chanik Plain. Uh, Leadbeater was a well-known clairvoyant and theosophist. He writes about the memory of nature in the following words. We must not omit to mention the ever-present background formed by the records of the past, the memory of nature, the only really reliable history of the world. While what we have on this plane is not yet the absolute record itself, but merely a reflection of something higher still, it is at any rate clear, accurate and continuous differing therein from the disconnected and spasmodic manifestation, which is all that represents it in the astral world. So again, this differentiation between the, the more accurate record, the accurate record on the mental plane and that on the astral plane, and yet the even less complete record that we find there for us on the physical plane. And William Scott Elliott, who was a well-known researcher into Atlantis, he was also a member of the Theosophical Society, he wrote in The Story of Atlantis that the memory of nature is in reality a stupendous unity, just as in another way all mankind is found to constitute a spiritual unity. If we ascend to a sufficiently elevated plane of nature in search of the wonderful convergence, where unity is reached without the loss of individuality. And so because from the theosophical worldview, everything is in essence a unity, this applies likewise to memory. And when we consider that time is itself only a categorization whereby we, we break existence into conceivable parts, when we remember that, it becomes easier to conceive of memory as being uh, a unity. Time is a unity, past, present, and future are simply categorizations which we find helpful in discussing and understanding time in the manifest world. J.P. Sinek further states that it was near the final culmination of the great Atlantean continent submergence, about 100,000 years ago from the present time, that the great stones still standing on Salisbury Plain were first established in their places. Okay, so we see here the date of the, of the submergence of, or the final submergence of Atlantis, which took place over a long period of time. And it was at this time that the adepts, having left Atlantis because Atlantis had become corrupt and its, its place as the, at the forefront of the world, uh, or its, its period, of being the great civilization of the world had passed. Therefore, the adepts uh, realizing or recognizing the need for the wisdom to spread to other corners of the earth, uh, abandoned Atlantis and brought the wisdom to the British Isles. And so overall, to, to conclude some of this information we've looked at so far, it's clear from, from the fragments and the hints that we can gather that Druidism, what, Druidism was one expression of the ancient wisdom or Theosophia that has existed across all cultures and climes since time immemorial. Like modern Theosophists, Druids were concerned chiefly with the search for truth in whatever form it may reveal itself. They recognized the hierarchical basis of life, 
and they conveyed this knowledge through the methods of myth and song. They preached the interconnectedness of man and nature and lived in harmony with the natural world. Central to their worldview were the concepts of periodicity and correspondence, and their rituals reflected the incessant cycles of life. So I think it's very interesting when we take these, especially these three central aspects of their juridic worldview, the hierarchical basis of life, the interconnectedness of man and nature, and periodicity and correspondence. When we take these three central ideas and we consider them in the light of modern theosophical teachings, we find that they're identical, aren't they? In theosophy, we also have this idea of the hierarchical basis of life that uh, from the from the atom to the soul, the logos, everything is possessed of consciousness. Everything has a particular position and place in nature and everything is, is gradually progressing upwards and onwards. It's an eternal pilgrimage, if you like. Um, and as Madame Blavatsky states, all of nature evinces a, a march towards a higher life. All of nature evinces a march towards a higher life. And so the whole purpose of evolution is to ascend higher on the hierarchical ladder, if you like. And so we also have this perception in the juridic worldview. Next, look at the interconnectedness of man and nature. Well, according to the teachings of modern theosophy, the human being is a microcosm of the macrocosm. And by extension, the cosmos is the macrocosm of the human being. And so we see that what applies to one must apply to the other in, in accordance with the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. And as we've mentioned over a few of our previous classes, the purpose of theosophy really is the study of these universal laws. And if a law be truly universal, it must apply on all levels and in all situations which is why in philosophy we're so interested in these concepts of karma, of reincarnation, of periodicity, of correspondence. These things apply necessarily on all levels. We can't take something that applies merely to the human being, but that doesn't apply to the universe and call that a universal principle. Likewise, we can't take something that we see applying on a cosmic level, but that doesn't apply to the human being or even smaller yet to the atom, and say that this is a universal principle. The universal principle must be just that. It must be universal and absolute insofar as we are discussing the, the, the period of manifestation in which it applies. So from a, a, a period, from a Manventeric perspective, if you like, it must be universal. And finally, we see that the Druids also had an understanding of periodicity and correspondence of everything in existence. Their whole worldview was centered around the cyclic nature of reality, of the turning of the wheel of the year. And the wheel of the year is just a, if you like, a microcosmic or an earth-based presentation of what takes place on a macrocosmic or a, a larger universal level. Not only does the will of the year apply to the seasons of our earth, but it also applies to the days and nights of Brahma, to the periods of Manvantara and Pralaya of our universe, our universe, universe's lives and deaths. And so, just as happened to all the other great schools of thought and philosophies of the ancient world, Druidism also came to an end. During the conquests of Julius Caesar, Druidism was essentially obliterated from the world. Blavatsky writes in The Secret Doctrine that Caesar, as a barbarian worthy of Rome, had already accomplished the destruction of the ancient mysteries by the sack of the temples and their initiatory colleges and by the massacre of the initiates and the druids. Remains Rome, but never she had but the lesser mysteries, shadows of the secret science, the great initiation, 
was extinct. And so it's interesting that Rome was incredibly developed in terms of its technological advances, its, its architectural glory, its conquests, and its, its physical sciences. But it was extremely underdeveloped spiritually and artistically because we see that it, it inherited or almost to an extent stole its spirituality and its art from cultures that preceded it. And I think this is here something that, that Madame Blavatsky is, is mentioning in the fact that they never had but the lesser mysteries. Rome never attained to the, the high state of spiritual advancement that we found in the previous civilization which it conquered. It never attained to those heights of Egypt or the heights of Greece or of the British Isles. And so it's quite interesting to see that a civilization can be incredibly developed in a physical or technological sense, but be far less developed in a spiritual sense. And a civilization can also be very developed in a spiritual sense, such as that of the Celtic civilization, but rather undeveloped in terms of, of physical civilization or technological civilization. Um, which is why the, the Celts were so easily overcome by the, the Romans. They were less technologically advanced. But however, in the examination of the cultures of antiquity, can it ever be found new evidence of the universality of theosophy? And while the tale of these ancient custodians of that ancient wisdom may be a tragic one, we can rejoice in the knowledge that the flame of their wisdom burns yet ever bright. For it lives on in our modern theosophy and in the message of universal brotherhood that is central to our worldview. By a study of these teachings, we may arrive at a deeper appreciation of the sacredness of nature and the harmony inherent in the order of the universe. In serving as custodians of the ancient wisdom in modern times, we are therefore the inheritors of the great and archaic tradition that was the theosophy of the Celtic world. And so that concludes the formal presentation for today. And I intentionally kept that a little bit shorter because I thought people might have some questions related perhaps to what we talked about today, but perhaps also about some of the other topics that we didn't get a chance to discuss previously. And further, perhaps we can open up questions regarding anything related to theosophy for any newcomers here or any, anything related to the discussions that we've had over the past four weeks. But I thought it might be nice to have an quite an interactive conclusion to this four week series because there has been there's been a lot of talking there's been a lot of information that has been shared and a lot to take in so i think it'd be great if we could have a bit more of an interact interactive conclusion so please if you have any questions or or comments uh please do take this chance to share them whether related directly to this topic or to any of the other topics we've been discussing i think uh, Vaughn Weber has a question. Right, is this in the chat box or, all right. Hi. Oh, hello. Hey, you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes, I was, um, and I noted that you mentioned the, this um, potion of the spirit of life was called Awen, right? Right. And I was wondering if, this is probably um, similar or same as the, the Amrita and, and Vedic theology. Right. Uh, when right. The Amrita, the, the potion of the nectar of life. Certainly. I think we could clearly draw an analogy between, between the Arwin of the Welsh tradition and the Amrita of the certainly of the uh, Sanskrit tradition. So they are both considered as being a potion of immortality or a potion of wisdom. 
we sometimes find that immortality and wisdom are synonymous. They are considered to be, in a sense, the same thing. Because when we consider the nature of wisdom, well, wisdom is, to try, is attempting to understand or tap into the fundamental nature of everything. And as we understand in theosophy, uh, that the nature of our life of existence is its eternity, its immortality. So in essence, all life is, is eternal. There is no true death in nature in the fundamental sense. And so I think we can see why Amrita, which, which translates as immortality, why this is also a nectar or a potion of wisdom, much like the Welsh Arwen. And again, all these stories come from the same fundamental source, don't they? It's not, it's not that they are simply coincidentally similar and it's an interesting coincidence from a comparative scholarly perspective. It's more than that. It's actually that these themes that we find that are so inherently or intrinsically uh, identical in different cultures, it's because they're springing from that same source, that same fundamental fount of wisdom. And so it's natural that these stories or myths take on their own individual cultural forms with their own characters and their own um, slight divergences, but the essential story remains the same. And so that was a, that was a great uh, analogy that you, that you mentioned there. And we do have a couple of questions in the chat box. So I'll, I'll take the chance to uh, briefly respond to those. We had someone asking who Madame Blavatsky was. So Madame Blavatsky was the outer founder of the Theosophical Society under which this uh, lecture series is uh, taking place. Um, and theosophy can be simply defined as the ageless wisdom, which is inherent in all cultures and all religions of the world. So Madame Blavatsky was a messenger, if you like. Uh, for the transmission of the ageless wisdom to the modern world. And you can find plenty of information about her on the various Theosophical Society websites, or you can find information um, just through a, a Google search. We also have a question about the, about the Book of Kells. All right, so... Uh, well, the Book of Kells was a, it, it was Celtic to an, a, an extent, certainly, it was Celtic culturally. Um, I wouldn't say it was Druid literature, it was, it was a gospel book, so it's a, a Christian book, actually, the Book of Kells, um, because it was composed in the ninth century, and by that time, the Druidic uh, culture had been long eradicated. And so in Britain, we have this series of conquests that take place beginning in the first century BCE. First of all, we have the Roman conquest of Britain. This, uh, at times, the Celts were able to fight back against the Romans, but the Romans would come again and again and again. And over time, despite the great bravery of the Celtic people in defending their homeland, uh, over time, the Romans were successful in um, in taking over the British Isles and establishing a um, establishing the Roman Empire there, and so we see these repeated invasions. And then, just several hundred years later, we also have the Saxon invasions of Britain, and so we have the the Saxons and Germanic tri and various Germanic tribes, the Danes and so on, coming in and and trying to settle in Britain. And with all of this taking place, we find the Druidic culture gradually being uh, exterminated, at least, at least in its outer forms, in its exoteric forms. And again, the Druids did not commit anything to writing. So the Book of Kells um, is an extremely beautiful, beautiful book, um, but it's, it's a work of Christian literature and art. Um, but Celtic in that it's Celt Celtic in insofar as it is made by the Celtic people who were at that time in history Christian. Um, we have a question, are there modern Druids today? It's a very good question. Yes, there are. There are many Druidic orders um, 
in existence. There have been druidic orders popping into existence over the past 300 years. These druidic orders don't attempt to be exact, exact replicas or exact um, continue, continuations of the druidry of ancient times, essentially because the ancient druids didn't commit anything to writing. We don't know exactly what they did, which is okay. We know some of their central ideas. We know what they held important. We know some of their core themes. And so we attempt to, as modern druids, we attempt to put into practice those central tenets of the druidic worldview. Uh, essentially, the, the modern or the contemporary druidic worldview is centered in a deep respect for the environment and nature, uh, an understanding of the interrelatedness of the human being and nature, rather than seeing the world as something that is simply a, uh, therefore our use to be exploited or to be, to be taken and, and used for our benefit. Rather, we see it as something of which we are a part. Uh, there was an, an American, I believe he was an American scientist called James Lovelock, who came up with a hypothesis called the Gaia hypothesis. Um, in this hypothesis, he states that much like the cells of the human body, the cells of the human body constitute um, various aspects or together they constitute the unity of the human body, we are as cells in the body of the earth, the earth itself being a living, breathing being. Um, possessed of a level of consciousness itself. And this is very much in line with the Druidic worldview we, and the Theosophical worldview. We see the earth as something um, to be respected and, and therefore we, some of the terminology we find modern, in modern day world, such as Mother Earth, we find this sort of idea in the Druidic worldview as well. Okay. Um, and yes, yeah, so I can provide information about modern druidic orders to anyone who is interested. We have a question regarding the druidic, uh, the supposed druidic sacrifice of humans. That's a very good question. Uh, scholars are divided in their perspectives on this one. The theosophical answer, the answer you'll find that H.P. Sinnott gives and that Madame Blavatsky gives, uh, that the Druids themselves never practiced human sacrifice or animal sacrifice. They lived in harmony with the animal world. But that as the Druidic school was corrupted towards its decline and end, at the end of the Druidic school, we find um, certain people who were interested merely in, in power and position they took control of the Druidic schools. And it may have been these people who um, corrupted the Druidic rites and carried out human or animal sacrifice. Okay, uh, certain of these questions I may not be able to answer off the top of my head, such as the secret doctrine references to the Mayans. Yes, there, there are many references to the Mayans in the secret doctrine. But I, I don't know off the top of my head whether they are said to have preceded the Vedas or, or not. I would have to look that up. Um, but I'm sure if you, again, if you do a Google search or you have a look on Theosophy Wiki or something like that, you may be able to find an answer to that question. Um, which volume of Isis Unveiled mentions the Serpent Mound? That is a good question. Let me see if I can bring up my notes. Okay, I'll come back to that one. I will, I will look it up and try to answer that question for you. Uh, we also have the, a comment uh, regarding the Druids being known as serpent tamers, similar to, to Shiva, yes, and how Ouroboros symbolizes rebirth, just like the Kundalini serpent in India. Certainly, so the serpent is a, well, it's a very ancient symbol that we find in a variety of cultures. And this Ouroboros symbol, uh, certainly it, it symbolizes death and rebirth and likewise symbolizes time. And we talked a bit about the Ouroboros and time as a god, time as the primordial god in the Greek lesson, didn't we? We mentioned that 
All right, and we have the a comment regarding how, yes, how uh, India is a good example of a nation historically and contemporarily, contemporarily that is very spiritually advanced. That's right. Which is why we find so much reference to India in the secret doctrine and in theosophy generally. Um, to, okay, does HPB ever mention the prophet the Danan at all from early Irish folklore? I don't believe they are mentioned specifically. I don't think there are many references to um, Irish folklore in the secret doctrine. However, you will find many references to Irish folklore in the issues of the Irish theosophists. So I'll, I'll write this down here. This is no longer, this is no longer running but it was a Theosophical publication of the Theosophical Society in Ireland that um, was published, I believe, from around the 1890s to the 1920s or so. And you can find, you can find copies of this online uh, for download. And there are quite a number of Irish Theosophists in there who, who examine Theosophy from the, perspective, from the Irish worldview or from the Irish perspective. <laughs> Uh, there's a uh, Rick London would like to make a comment certainly. Thanks, Luke. I really appreciate the uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, everybody, Nancy, for putting this together. It's been a delightful uh, four Saturday mornings for me. Uh, I'm kind of a tree hugger, uh, and I'm uh, very uh, grateful to be more to be made more aware of how uh, the Druids held nature to be so sacred. Um, I find that very inspiring. I also was thinking about how the Romans, uh, uh, Blavatsky's uh, remark about the Romans and the, um, the cliche that all roads lead to Rome. And uh, it seems ironic to me that it's my personal belief that all roads lead to theosophy. And I uh, just wanted to thank you for bringing these uh, four uh, Upanishads, uh, the uh, Egyptians, Greeks, Druids, uh, uh, combining all of this and even underscoring uh, more deeply how all roads lead to theosophy. So just wanted to thank you personally. Well, th thank you for those comments, Rick. I'm glad you found it to be an interesting topic and yes one of the great things about druidry and the druids in particular were that they were tree huggers they were very much in tune with nature and the environment and the natural world which i've always thought is something that uh theosophy should or theosophists should really um take on board a little more i think that uh theosophy is a very environmentally friendly worldview isn't it it's the ideas of our interconnectedness with all of life, our association with all life, the fact that all of life is on a ladder which leads to the same destination and that we were once in the position that many other um, creatures in the world are now in. And when we, we see this, uh, this sort of eternal, continuous um, cycle of, 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 of nature, that is gradually moving onwards and upwards to higher and higher forms. I think when we see that, um, it gives us a deep respect for nature. And you can definitely see how that would manifest as a, uh, in the worship, if you like, of the Druids and the worship of the natural world. You can certainly see the sacredness of nature um, in their worldview. And I think that should very much continue to be a, um, a significant aspect of the theosophical worldview and the modern movement as well. I think there should be more efforts taking place for the preservation of the natural world. And, then, and it's great to see that there, there are many movement, uh, movements and activities, for example, um, taking place through the theosophical order of service uh, in, an, in terms of animal rights and so on. Uh, particularly in, in Adya and I believe in the American section as well, we see this taking place. So I think it is our duty as theosophists to protect the natural world and our, our animal brothers and sisters.
Right. Well, I hope uh, this has been helpful or of interest anyway. Of course, there are many other cultures that we could have examined um, that if we had had more time, it would have been interesting to go into some of the, um, for example, the Native American worldview you might have been an interesting one to examine. We could have gone into a variety of other cultures, but we only had a chance for a select few. So I chose four, which I thought might be of interest to people. And this one in particular was of interest to me and something I have been researching for a while. And it's something which I don't think has been studied uh, recently, at least um, in enough depth by Theosophical writers. So I, I think it's fascinating to see how you can take any culture and put that under the the theosophical magnifying glass, if you like, uh, and you can discover all sorts of of connections and similarities and and uh, secrets therein. Um, I have a question, real quick, if I can say something. Am I am I audible? Yes, yes. Continue. Oh, bless you. Thank you so, so much for this incredible series. And I, I just don't know how to say, please, 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 may there be more, many, many more. Um, I wanted to ask about the topical uh, subject as where we are right now, as we are all talking to each other uh, in this, and the unexplained laws of nature that is part of our objectives. We need to investigate these. And as you've gone through, um, we are kind of where the Atlanteans are, are we not? You know, carnivorizing our, our God and building these buildings. And, and we, are, we are having a lesson at hand from our mother earth. Do you have any thoughts, uh, Luke, uh, as you look at these civilizations and the rise and fall, as these teachings are rising to the surface, as they have for many of us, they come knocking and they're back and that we're able to connect all over the world of the future uh, of the theosophical teachings and the hope that remains for humanity within them, especially now when we're here and we're listening and it is time to heed. Yes, it's a very good question. It's good to think about, well, first of all, the, the practical aspects of the fact that these teachings have come to us now at this particular point in history and have become so available to the world. And we see, uh, if, if you examine some of the writings of the, the Mahatmas in their letters to, to Mena Blavatsky and H.P. Sinnott, A.P. A. P. Sinnott and so on, uh, we see that the, the Theosophical movement, its establishment and its spread across the world was no coincidence. It was a, a planned and intentional uh, time in history that Theosophy became so universally known. And then we find 100 years after the founding of the Theosophical Society, another very interesting event, and that was the birth of the internet. And what is more unifying than the internet in terms of technology right now? The, the internet is literally this, this body in which all knowledge is contained and in which everyone may reach out across countries, across across nationalities across any boundaries to connect instantly with our brothers and sisters around the world i think it's it's definitely there's something something meaningful there that the 100 years after the founding of the theosophical society the internet came about i think um, this is significant and and relevant to us and now we have not only the philosophy not only the world view of theosophy we are given the tool through the internet and uh, to, to do something with this. And I think as theosophists living in the modern world, we must continue to modernize our, our techniques, our methods of studying these ancient teachings, just as we see the, the rise and fall of these schools of thought, uh, the rise and school of these great, the, the rise and fall of these great civilizations. Um, so too does, does, does history continue? So too does the ageless wisdom pass from one medium to another or from one group to another or from one uh, method of transmission to another. And now I think it's, it's very significant that it's taking place through the internet and that the internet is essentially a unifying uh, uh, body. It brings people together. And I think we have a, a mission, if you like, in the light of all of this. I think we are now better able to understand the practical aspects of theosophy. 
uh, the world now is more open to these ideas. Maybe not under the name Theosophy, but we find in other religions a, a, a bringing down of the walls that were constructed around them. We find that religious leaders are more likely now to uh, coexist with one another, but more than coexisting, we find that they're, they're generally coming together, being friendly, these interfaith movements, these interfaith efforts that are coming together, all for the benefit of hum our common humanity, our common humankind. Um, I cer I've certainly noticed that in England, in the relationship, for example, between the Catholic and Protestant uh, denominations of Christianity, just as a very small example, the friendships that have um, being that have been formed between these denominations, which would have been unheard of one or two hundred years ago, and I think this is happening on a, on a cross religious um, way now. We we find Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and Muslims all coming together in a much friendlier way than beforehand, and I think we're finding that it's less important what particular religion or philosophy or organization or background one has, I think we're starting to recognize that there is a common humanity that exists behind and beyond all of these things. And that it's that common humanity and beyond that, our, our common interconnectedness with all of life, that is the important thing. The words, the language and the forms whereby this may be expressed may change, but the, the fact remains the same. And so I think anything that we do that helps us to come together and helps us to connect with one another. And also that puts us in a position to be of service to the world. It doesn't matter whether this is through the means of the Theosophical Society or through, through it, whatever means this might be. Anything that allows us to help the world and to be of service to the world, and we're all able to be of service to the world. It, I don't think there's any excuse. I don't think anyone can say, I don't have the talents to be of service. I don't think that's a true statement for anyone. Um, we all have different skills, whether that is um, through charitable work, through writing, through, through whatever it might be, through leading, through organizing. We all have something we can offer. And that something, whatever it may be, is valuable and meaningful. And there is no such thing as an act of service too small from the theosophic perspective. So I think, I think things will continue. I'm, I'm rather optimistic. I think things will continue to go forward in a positive way. I think we're seeing this coming together of people in the world. And I think it will continue to go in, the, in this direction. We also have a, a, another question. I'm sorry, I've just noticed. Uh, if the Druids and the Celts were remnants of the Atlantean civilizations, how come they were not able to create a high civilization on similar lines? Well, we find in history the rise and fall of great civilizations, and perhaps Atlantis was the last great civilization um, in the terms of the long cycle that we are a part of. And perhaps in the future, a greater civilization will arise as the successor of the Atlantean civilization. So I think it, it's just that the, the fall of Atlantis was in in cosmic terms, a very short time ago. And it has not been long enough yet for another great civilization to arise. So I think that's a question uh, which will be answered in the future when another great civilization does arise as a successor to the Atlantean civilization. And there's a nice, a nice quote there from, from Linda. Um, God or goddess does not call the qualified. He or she qualifies the call. It's a wonderful quote. And yes, certainly. I think, I think we are all called in our individual capacities towards the work. And sometimes we might not, it might not be clear, first of all, what we can do. We might have a calling and we might not know how that calling will manifest in practical terms, but it will manifest. There will be a position for us. Uh, there will be something for us to do, and that will become obvious to us uh, once we answer that call. Uh, would you be able to place the Australian Aboriginal culture within the Atlantean and Lemurian scheme? Very interesting question. 
Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure it is answered. And I, I believe I've come across it in my research before, but I don't know off the top of my head. So you may need to uh, search for that on Theosophy Wiki, where the Australian Aboriginal culture fits into the uh, Theosophical concept of root races. That's a good question, but I, I don't recall. And yes, in the in the Christian tradition, we also have the idea of thy will be done. But here, perhaps in terms of the interconnectedness of everything and the interconnectedness to in a absolute sense of the universe and humanity and God, we can understand that this will being carried out, it is the, the, the will, the will of the absolute being carried out. It benefits all. It benefits everyone. It benefits us on an individual level, but that's not the important thing. It benefits the world and it benefits everything in existence in the more important level. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not, um, someone mentions that perhaps there were some less positive statements about the Aboriginal or South Sea Islander cultures in some of the philosophical writings, but I, I really don't know off the top of my head. So we may need to uh, look that up. And so, okay. And so, uh, again, just uh, another brief reminder that hopefully these are uh, within the next few months, we will be continuing something a little bit similar along these lines. Um, hopefully with guest speakers from theosophical sections around the world, we want to get something like this up and running as the virtual theosophy center, um, taking with, with continuous classes taking place throughout the year. On a range of different subjects so we'd want this to continue even after the current pandemic has passed so that might be another positive thing that has arisen from what has been a, a rather sad and, and difficult time for everyone around the world um, we're hoping that uh, this will be a, a chance for theosophists, particularly isolated theosophists um, or who, people who are interested in theosophy but not able to attend physical lodge meetings. They may be able to come together and join in some classes such as this online. Okay, well, Luke, thank you so much. This has, has been incredible. Um, just wonderful, thank you. As far as the future of theosophy and moving forward with the teach teachings, well, isn't that what we're doing right now? Everyone is, is coming together under Zoom. We have people from all over the world um, joining us and other meetings that are going on. So, you know, look at the good side of the quarantine. Uh, we had a chance to stop and take a breath and connect with everyone. And um, I see that continuing uh, virtually and in, in all different ways. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone so much for being part of this. If you would like a copy of the video um, and Luke's slides, if you're on my mailing list you will get a complete uh set i will send them out to everyone if not you can email either luke or myself and and we will be able to send them out to you well, i just want to say a big thank you to nancy for setting this up for arranging it and for for what a wonderful time it has been over the past four weeks it's been been very educational for me as well. There's always, you, you find when you, as a, as a presenter, you find that, um, well, in, in philosophy, when you have a role as a, a lecturer or a presenter or whatever, you're, you are merely a student of philosophy. Uh, everyone is a student of philosophy. There are no real um, experts on philosophy because philosophy is such a, a vast body of wisdom and knowledge. And it's a very humbling experience uh, to be a presenter and to realize how little you know 
And it's always a very educational experience I've found to, to look into these subjects, to, to take the, the little knowledge that I have perhaps gathered from my research and to share it with other people and to learn from the other people who join in these sessions, uh, to, to, to hear so many interesting insights and perspectives from everyone. So it's been a really fascinating experience taking part in this online class with all of you. So thank you, Nancy, for, for arranging this. You're welcome. Thank everyone and everyone be well and stay safe. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.